which I thought was great because I really thought if there's any place extra virgin is going to work, it's sales. In general, what predicts being good at work is conscientiousness. It's people who work hard and do what they're supposed to and don't slack up and show up on time. So when we interview people, we, extroversion matters. When people work, we really want people who are conscientious. So it's another one of those cases where extroversion matters at the beginning but not later on. You get the same model in leadership to some extent with leadership emergence, people who are more likely to become leaders. You find they tend to be highly extroverted. Effective leaders tend to be extroverted as well, though it's not quite as important for being effective as getting the job in the first place. You see this in business and government and student leadership. There's very high relationships with extroversion, which makes sense because if you want to be student body president, you have to slap flyers all over the place and talk about yourself. And um, it just sounds horrid, probably to everybody in this room, but it's not what it takes, or that's what it takes. I then, this is one of my favorite data sets, is a study of U.S. presidents. What they did was they had historians rate presidential personalities, and they've looked at these over time. It's really interesting. So this is what presidents seem to be. 50 on this is the midpoint. So this is a T-score, so a 50 sort of is the middle. So presidents seem to be about the middle of neuroticism. They're extroverted, about a half standard deviation above what's normal for extroversion. Not too open to ideas. That's, I mean, that's a little frightening, isn't it? I'm outgoing but dumb. Perfect. Um, they're not too agreeable, meaning they're willing to step on people, which is what it takes. I mean, you probably watch House of Cards. This is like your perfect House of Cards guy, you know, kind of borderline psychopath. And they're really hardworking, which makes sense. So this is an interesting model. But then this, this study also looked at great presidents. And what's fascinating is, is you get a different pattern. It's not the extroversion that matters, even though that's what gets you the job, it's the openness to experience, it's the intellect. it's the people with vision. So again, extroversion, we, we, select, the extra, we select the extroverts, and we, the people who tend to do a good job are the ones who are much more open to experience. So I, I find that fascinating. The other thing is extroversion in presidents matters a lot more now than it did 150 years ago, because you can look at that over time. So does narcissism. Um, and academic engagement's another one. So I, I, I try to look into this. Does extroversion predict engagement? Um, it does. It predicts social engagement for obvious reasons. Predicts academic engagement. If you're in a class that demands you're out there talking to people, promoting yourself, it's going to be extroversion. Here's what it doesn't predict. It doesn't predict grades. Extroverts don't have any better grades. Introverts don't. It's not the power. Of, it's not like, hey, I'm so quiet, I get A's. But it doesn't, make, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Conscientiousness does, and openness probably. Um, it doesn't predict retention. What it predicts is this report of engagement, being involved. Um, I hope I'm not making people depressed in here. Is that, is that a little depressed? I have some stuff at the end that's less depressing. Um, then I looked at likability and popularity. And again, this is with the whole big five here. What you see is, these things don't matter. Extroversion really matters to being liked. People who are extroverted are liked more. This is with adolescents. So does being nice and not so depressed. But these are smaller. Extroversion is the big one. You find similar things with popularity, except um, popular, people are, popular people are a little less conscientious and not so nice. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, who were the cool kids in high school? You know, the outgoing people who did bad things. Um, <laughs> you know, not the ones you like, but the ones who were popular. Then sometimes you go, and this is a question I was asking myself, well, maybe on emerging media, you know, maybe you're going to see a difference because if I'm sort of tweeting, I can be introverted. You know, like a lot of radio guys. I'm introverted, but I, I, I'm out there on the radio. What you find, though, with a lot of this... Emerging media is the same pattern where people who are extroverted show, these, show greater effects. So they have more photos on Facebook. They have more wall posts on Facebook. They're a member of more groups on Facebook. They have a lot more friends. I should put that in quotes. Um, it's like all my LinkedIn buddies. I make them every day. 
like, hey, be my friend on LinkedIn. I'm like, okay, so and so from you know New South Wales. <laughs> they have, they follow more people on Twitter. They they tweet more a little bit, and they have higher cloud scores. Cloud score is a, a measure of sort of um, what would it, eminence on the, is that the right word? Eminence on emerging media. How much cloud? I mean, that's it's clout, but it's with a C. So. Extroversion does seem to predict outgoingness in social media as well. Um, I don't know about, about gaming or other sort of alternative medias, but with social media, it seems to make a difference. So I thought about this stuff for a while, and I started thinking about myself and how I function, because when I looked at these data, I thought, God, there's a, the world wants, extroversion, I'm pretty introverted. I never felt bad about that before, but there's things I've been doing, and so, uh, so then I put them together and I called them five R's, because I wanted them to have one letter in common. I, I don't know, I'm sorry, that's pretty silly, but I just, I got going, I was tired. Um, here's the biggest thing in terms of, when I look at the data, what I see is, if you're introverted, extroversion has to be something you can do sometimes. It has to be a tool in the toolbox. And I say the same thing about narcissism. Sometimes you have to be a horrid self-promoter in the world these days. And sometimes you've got to be extroverted. You're going to have to be extroverted when you're standing in front of people talking, you're in front of a classroom. You're going to have to be extroverted when you go for a job interview. You're going to have to be extroverted when you date. You're going to have to be extroverted when you make friends. It's just something you have to do. The thing is, it only has to be in short bursts from what it looks like. You have to get the job. After you have the job, no one's like, hey, are you extroverted today? They just want to know if you're hard work and you're a decent person. Um, but you have to be able to do it a little bit. And most people can. Um, the other thing you see, and you see this in a lot in, the, in the, the social anxiety literature, but really any literature is practicing, repeating stuff makes it work. So I was thinking about myself, and I was really introverted, and then I got a job as a bellman. So I had to meet people like over and over and over and over, and that helped a lot. And then for those of us who are academics, you know, when you start pe speaking in public or in front of a classroom, you get better at it and better at it, and you get shoved in conferences, and pretty soon it, it just, you start to change. And I remember the first, I, I was, this is a sick thing you do as a psychologist, like taking personality tests on myself, looking for change. And I remember I was I started getting ones that I'm like, wait a second, I'm ex extroverted a little bit. Like I started changing. I felt like a moron, but um, but you do change doing that. Um, the other thing that's that's really interesting is this idea of re-energizing. Whenever we act in ways that are different than we are. So if I'm introverted and I act extroverted, if I'm extroverted and act introverted, if I'm nice and act mean, you know, if somebody says, go be mean, even though you're nice, whenever you do something you're not, you act secure, you act brave, even when you're not brave, even when you're scared. Whenever we act a way we're not, it takes energy. It's like working a muscle. It's like doing push-ups. You get tired. And what happens when you do that is the more you do it, the better you're going to get. The more you act some way you're not, the better you're going to get at it. At the same time, though, you're going to have to have rest periods. Does that make sense? So you're going to need a, if you use a bunch of energy to act, in this case, extroverted, you're going to need a break. So what I tend to do is I tend to plan breaks. Like I had to do a talk last week. It was really fun. Then I just crashed, and then I was at a conference all weekend, and then I had to do this. I'm, I'm tired, Sylvia. I'm tired. And all I think about is if somebody wrapped me in a cocoon and shot me into space like that movie Gravity and just gave me Netflix and a bunch of dark chocolate and then grabbed me in three days, I'd be perfect. <laughs> so, so you have to plan, and I'm not going to do that because I have to go pick up my kids, but if I could... That's what I'd like to do right now. So if you, if, when I go to conferences, I'll go, okay, I'll go to this meeting, this meeting, then I'll just take a walk for a while and sort of just get normal again. Then I'll go back and do it. And, and people think I'm incredibly extroverted. And I, like I said, I am more than I was. But you need to re-energize yourself to make it work. You've got to think about this as like a sprint or using a muscle. 
Um, the other thing is, talking too much about myself, but, but why not, is, is this idea of recalibrating. So this is a great study that just came out. Um, what they looked at is something called affective forecasting, which is our ability as people to guess or to forecast how we're going to feel in a social situation. And we can do this accurately, so we can ac accurately guess or forecast how we're going to be or not. And what they found was that people who were introverted, when they imagined being in a social situation, they, they thought it would make them feel bad. They thought it would be distressing, that it would take too much energy, and they had no interest in doing this. After they did it, they, they tended to say that was actually kind of fun to hang out with people. I'm tired, but it's actually kind of fun. I do this all the time. My life is, what are we doing tonight? To my wife, Stace. Well, here's, see, I don't make decisions anymore. I outsource that. Um, <laughs> we're going to so-and-so's house for a party. How about I stay home and watch a really bad Korean martial arts movie on Netflix and you go to the party? Wouldn't that be better? No, you have to go, okay. Then I go to the party, and I have fun. I'm like, why was I so? Why didn't I want to go? Because I thought it would be exhausting. And then they're chatting with people, like Chatty Cathy, and it's great. So somehow I, there's something wrong on average. I don't think everybody's this way, but what the research tends to show is that people are introverted or just underestimating how stressful social situations are. So there needs to be some recalibration. And finally, this is something I was, I was thinking about. When, whenever you do something, you can pull different personality traits. So I can be in a group setting, and I can say, this is about extroversion. It's about being sociable. It's about being outgoing. Or I can say, this is really about ideas. This is about a new experience. This is about openness. Or I can say, this is about doing my job. This is conscientiousness. If, I, if my problem is I'm not that sociable, I don't really like talking to people, but I really like ideas because I'm really open to experience, if I can reframe things as being about openness, I'll do better. So I could sit in a seminar room, I don't want to talk to anybody, but I really like ideas. So I could have a really interesting conversation about ideas if I reframe what I'm doing. Does that make any sense? I kind of made this one up, I'll be honest. I was, the other ones have some research behind them. This is kind of bogus, but I think it's true. Um, and so to the extent you can do that, I think it's going to help. Again, science is not settled on this. Um, I'm trying to think if I find myself doing it. I think, what I, I, think I do it to some extent with, with, with openness. But I, I get really excited about ideas and forget about a lot of social stuff, which is, which is good. And then I started thinking about... You know, and this is after talking to you, Sylvia, about these, some of these issues is how do we turn this around? If we're in a position where a professor, we're a teammate, we're a friend of somebody who's really introverted, how do we sort of learn, use this information and, and relate to people? Um, the first thing is noticing people. And this is, I've talked to so many of my students about this. Um, if I'm talking to people, there's, there's always somebody who just shoots their mouth out all, all, all the time. And you just want them to stop. You know, you're like, please, God, don't say another word. But then there's a lot of people who are just really extroverted and talk, and you pay attention to them. And then there's two people who are sitting back, and they don't talk. And maybe they come out, and then maybe they come up to after class and say something. But you tend not to notice as much because you notice the people who are out there talking. They're just more salient. So you need to notice everybody you're talking to. And second, it's sort of reaching out to people. And, and, and in terms of... If I'm sitting around a seminar room and I've got 10 people, and five are talking all the time, what are the odds those five have all the best ideas? The odds are very slim. Probably they've got as good ideas as anybody else, but there's another five people with really good ideas who aren't saying anything. So if I can reach out to those five and bring them into the conversation, the conversation's gonna be better. The ideas are gonna be better. And it, all it means is noticing and sort of pulling people in. And, the, and I, if we've all had this. You know, people after class will come up to you and they say, well, here's my idea. And you're like, why didn't you say that in front of those 15 people when you were under pressure? <laughs> not how I don't really like to roll that way, Dr. Campbell. Um, but that's part of the issue. And, and there could be other, way, other mechanisms for doing that. And I'll talk about that in a second. Another is discounting. This is a term, a psychological term for sort of accounting for or... Yeah, I'll just give you an example. 
So if I interview somebody for a job, and they're really extroverted, I go, I like this person, I want to hire them, even though extroversion isn't part of the job. When pre people run for president, I'm always like, well, this person seems charming and charismatic, I'll vote for them. I'm like, really? That's not what I want. I want them to be somebody smart and honest. Um, but the extroversion gets overweighed. So somehow we have to remember what we're, we have to remember that we're going to be swayed more by extroversion than we should be, if that makes sense. I'm not saying don't hire extroverts. I'm just saying we need to look beyond that and look for some other job qualifications. I think this is a problem with interviewing. I'm, I know there's some I.O. people here that uh, would agree with that. That's probably the part of the problem, which is interviews, is that you, over, you sort of overcount uh, the social skills and you undercount other stuff. Um, so using multiple sources when you, do, when you do evaluation makes sense. And finally, there's this issue of structures. Um, when we set up situations that totally involve sociability, whether it's team learning for everything or to sole discussion-based grading, participation grading, my daughters in, in grade school get these grades. They're like, these kids, or your, your kids, I have a special term for it, like participate and talk in class. And you go, well, that's good, right? Well, that's, no, in the old days, you used to just shut up in class. That was considered good. Like, your daughter shuts up. That's really great. She's a great student. I had never heard a peep from her. Um, but we've changed what's normal. And so when we set up structures that pull for, for extroversion and we don't see extroversion, it's going to be a problem for people who are introverted, which is something to think about. It, it, it's probably useful to set up multiple structures. Um, thanks. Thank you.